نحمد و نسلی علی رسول الکریم اعوض باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری واحل العقدت من لسانی یفقہ قولی و جعل لی وزیر من آخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اللہم ارن الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارن الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہو Today we will start with our discussion of Surah Al-Baqarah verse 62 Allah says, Indeed, those who believed and those who were the Jews or the Christians or Sabarin before Prophet wasallam, those among them who believed in Allah and the last day and did what? The second thing, did righteousness will have the reward. And what will be the reward with their Lord? No fear will be, will be there concerning them, nor will they grieve. Now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning and talking about three religious groups and is talking about their status on the day of judgment the three groups are hadu the people who call themselves the jews now remember that religion or all the religions which were brought and taught by the prophets was always islam Followers of all the prophets call themselves what? As mentioned in Quran, نَحْنُ لَهُ Muslimun. That we are what? We are named as Muslims. So the followers of Hazrat Musa a.s. They had created this name of Yahud or Jews themselves. There was no such name suggested by their prophet or in their book. No such name was used to address them in Torah or the Old Testament. So it was a self-created, a fabricated and innovative name Name they had created for them themselves. The second Allah is talking about Nasara. They are the helpers of the Christians. They, this also was a name they had started themselves. No such name was used for the followers of Hazrat Isa a.s. in the New Testament or in Injil. They believed in Hazrat Isa a.s. and when Hazrat Isa a.s. he called out for help to preach, to spread the teachings of Allah and for the implementation of the message of Allah, Hazrat Isa a.s. called Man Nanswari illallah. Who out of you will be helpers for me in the path of Allah? Then it is they, these followers of Hazrat Isa a.s. who um, replied and who reciprocated by saying, Nahnu Answarullah, that we will be the helpers of Allah. We will help the Prophet of Allah. So, because of this, because of this, they called back and because they helped Hazrat Isa they started calling themselves as helpers. Because uh, Answar, the root word is Noon Swadra, and Nasra means help. So, Naswara means the helpers. The third group Allah is talking about and referring about is the Sabi'een. Now, who are the Sabi'een? They are the fire worshippers. 
are certain people say that they are the people who worship the suns or the stars and the people in Mecca and the Quraysh in Mecca they thought and they labeled the people who had abandoned the religion of their ancestors they were labeled as sabaeen and by this reference of uh, definition of sabaeen the people in Mecca they called prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a sabi also because they thought that he had left the religion of hazrat ibrahim alaihi salam and he had um, uh, left the religion of their ancestors and that is why they called prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a sabi and you know what this this actually was the actual religion why the people in makkah they had started opposing prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam despite the fact that before he had announced his prophethood and before he had starting condemning he had started condemning the religion they had adopted he was always he was an apple of the eye and they always were calling him as as-sadiq the truthful and the trustworthy so now only now they had started opposing prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they were enemies with him because it was shaitan who had made them realize that they were on the correct path being the followers of hazrat ibrahim alaihi salam because we know that they had made so many changes in the teachings of hazrat ibrahim uh, hazrat ibrahim alaihi salam's teachings and they were the religion which they were practicing at the time of prophet or prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was no longer the religion which was taught to them by hazrat ibrahim alaihi salam but still they thought that they were on the religion of hazrat ibrahim alaihi salam and so the people of makkah in good faith considering it as a virtuous deed they were opposing prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam just because they were blaming him and they were considering that they were on the right religion and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had left the religion of their ancestral uh, forefathers shaitan had made them believe that what they were doing in fighting and opposing prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was perfectly right thing to do under the situation So you see this is shaitan this is shaitan and this is how he manages to misguide people and this is how he makes such a major sin look like a virtuous deeds that is why we need to be extremely sensitive we need to be extremely sensitive continuously against the attacks and the tactics of shaitan frequent recitation of a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim and frequent recitation of the quranic supplication rabbi a'udhu bika min hamazati shayatin wa a'udhu bika rabbi an yakhzuruni we need to be continuously alert and mindful for our selves and our children regarding the attack of shaitan shaitan who out of sheer enmity he out of sheer enmity to the children of adam alay salam he announced in the dialogue with allah that i will divert i will distract and i will misguide them from the path of jannah that is why shaitan has been announced as allah says innahu lakum aduwwu mubin there is absolutely no doubt that he is an open enemy for you all so now in this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about three groups and allah says that among them who do two things who do two things that is they do what they do they are what man amana billah that they have faith in allah and the day of judgment and the second thing is wa amila salihan they do virtuous and righteous deeds when they do these two things having faith and doing virtuous deeds they will be they will be rewarded with what and the result will be what two results wala khawfun alayhim wala hum yahzanun that there will be no fear for them and they will not grieve also when on the day of judgment so from here i would want to talk about a topic which is very frequently asked as a question 
Very frequently people ask that what does the Quran say about the forgiveness of the people of the book? What will will they be forgiven on the day of the judgment? Or will the Jews and the Christians will they be subjected to the torments on the day of judgment? So what we gather from this verse is what Allah is saying in this verse is that the Jews and the Christians will be forgiven. But you see that in all the verses of the Quran, most of the verses of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has labeled the Jews and the Christians as disbelievers. And they have been mentioned and they have been promised torments like the inmates of hellfire. So what is this? Is there a contradiction in Quran? There can't be. There can't be a contradiction in Quran and there never is a contradiction in Quran. So how do we explain and relate this verse and the rest of the verses regarding the, the reward or the punishment of the people of the book? Now to explain all this, I would want to revise that we all know that there are five articles of faith. Five articles of faith being faith and belief in Allah, His angels, His books, His prophets, and in the Day of Judgment. And as far as the belief and the faith in the prophets and in the books is concerned, for the perfection and for the completion of this faith and belief in the prophets and in the books we are all needed to what we are all needed to believe in all the prophets and all the books yuminuna bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablika so the faith and the belief will only be perfected and completed if the person having faith believes in all the prophets and all the books. Now what was the state of affairs with the Jews? In fact, what is the current state of affairs with the Jews? The Jews, they believed in Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and they believed in his book Torah, that is the Old Testament. But they did not, even in the life of the Prophet sallallahu and they still do not. They do not have belief and faith in Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and in Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. And they refuse to have faith and belief in the New Testament or Injil and the book revealed to Prophet sallam, that is Quran. So their belief is not complete. Hence, according to most of the verses of Quran, there is no promise for their forgiveness or of Jannah. Similarly, Christians, even in the life of Prophet ﷺ, and even the current Christians, they believe in Hazrat Isa salam and they, bere- they believe in the New Testament or in Injil. But even in the life of Prophet ﷺ, and even till now, they fail to believe and have faith in the prophethood of Muhammad ﷺ and the book of Quran revealed to him. So, the faith of the Christians is not complete. Hence, without the completion and perfection of faith, since one of the two things is not right, So, the faith and the belief is not perfected, so they will not receive any promise for Jannah, and they will not be forgiven. This is what we learn from the verses of Quran. But now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising forgiveness on the day of Jannah. So how do we explain this? Those Jews who before the prophethood of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they and the revelation of Injil, they believed in Hazrat Musa and... <coughs> And in the Old Testament and Torah. I repeat again, those Jews 
who before the prophethood of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and before the revelation of Injil, they believed in Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and also in Torah. And they acted upon the teachings of Allah and Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and the Old Testament and they did righteous deeds. Their faith was perfect. If they did righteous deeds, then those Jews will be forgiven and they will be saved from the torments of hellfire. Similarly, those Christians, all those Christians who believed who who believed in Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and in the book Injil revealed to him before the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and before the revolution of Quran. Their faith was complete. Their belief was perfect. So if they obeyed the teachings of Allah and their prophet and their book and according to the message of their verses, they did righteous deeds, then they have been promised Jannah. Because they did righteous deeds and their faith was perfect, so they have been offered and promised forgiveness and release from hellfire. So if I summarize in this verse, the verse mentions the forgiveness of the righteous Jews prior to the prophethood of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and the virtuous, obedient, righteous Christians prior to the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Verse number 63. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَكُمْ وَرَفَعْنَا فَوْقَكُمُ الطُّورِ خُذُّوا مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ بِقُوَّةٍ وَاذْقُرُوا مَا فِيهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ سُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَلَوْ لَفَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَقُنْتُمْ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Allah says, And recall when we took your covenant, O children of Israel, to abide by the Torah, and we raised over you the mount, saying, Take, take what we have given you, and take it how? Take it with determination. And do what? Remember what is in it, that perhaps you may become righteous. Now in this verse, number 63, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remem reminding the Bani Israel, and especially the Jews of Medina, and even the Jews till the day of judgment reminding the people of Bani Israel of a covenant. Which covenant? When was it made? Who made it? With whom was it made? What was it about? What were the words of the covenant and how was it made? People of the Bani Israel and the followers of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam were forced to make this covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When? If I revise briefly, when with the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and his followers seeing the belief and seeing the righteous deeds of the people and the followers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them and guided them and release them from the clutches of the cruel and the tyrant rulers and bless them with freedom in the desert. They settled in the desert and then they were showered with the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were given the clouds and they were blessed with the twelve springs and they were given the heavenly provisions to eat and to drink. And then they were thankless and they were greatly ungrateful. And during this period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after settling them in the desert, 
and then showering their blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Hazrat Ibrahim Hazrat Musa alayhi salam for 40 days meeting and the purpose of this meeting was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give them the orders the commandments of their sharia the do's the don'ts the permissible the non-permissible the concept of sin and the concept of the virtues all had to be given to them and the orders of Allah had to be had to be assigned to them so Hazrat Musa alayhi salam was called for a 40 day meeting on the mount of Tur and there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Hazrat Musa alayhi salam his initial 10 commandments and these 10 commandments they were not only they were not only taught and informed to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam they were handed over to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam written on stone slates and it were these stone slates with the written ten commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Hazrat Musa alayhi salam returned to his people in the desert from the Mount Thur. And then he asked them, he handed them over, he educated them with these with these ten commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we will be going through soon, inshallah, after the verse 83. And he asked them to have faith in them and have belief in them and to act according to them and to accept these ten commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and very obstinately and very stubbornly did the people of Bani Israel refuse to have faith, belief and obedience to these ten commandments. These ten commandments were handed over to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam written on, written on stone slates. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, was very well aware of the temperament of people of Bani Israel, how stubborn, how obstinate and how disobedient they were. They were handed over these ten commandments written on, wood, on the stone slates so that they could see it by their own eyes. So that they could actually see it with their own eyes and touch, touch them with their own hands so that it could, touching and seeing all that could make belief and faith and obedience easy and possible for them. And then they were engraved on these wooden slates so that with their hands they could not rub them off, they could not delete them, they could not change or alter them. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them written and engraved on the wooden slates but still seeing them, touching them. They still failed to believe and act according to them. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered that the Mount Thur be tilted on them. And the Mount Thur was tilted on them in an inclined position and it seemed to them as if it would fall on the settlement as a punishment or a torment of Allah. So in this situation, the Bani Israel got scared. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually wanted to scare them off. So they were scared. They feared the torment of Allah. And they feared that if they disobey, the Mount Thur would just fall on them and crush them. So in this state of fear, the people of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, the fear of the Mount falling on them, they promised and they made a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they agreed to make a covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of his obedience. Then what happened? When the mount came back to its normal position and the fear and the scare went off, they just broke off the covenant. And they again came back to their state of disobedience. Now when Allah ordered them to make a covenant of obedience, what did Allah order them while taking them, while taking from them a covenant? Allah said, Khuzu. Khuzu means take, to take, to grip, to hold tight. Ma atakum. Whatever you have been, you have been given. Whatever you have been blessed, whatever you have been taught and educated. Allah said that what I have given you as commandments, as the Ten Commandments of Musa, take them, grip them and hold tight to them. Hold to them like how? بِقُوَّةٍ With full 
power, with willpower, with strength, with full determination, with full concentration and with full strength. And then do what? Waskuru ma fihi. Remember and mention what was in these ten commandments. And then Allah promised and Allah told them that if they adopt the style and manner of, of teachings they were given, if they adopt this style and this mannerism of connecting with the teachings of Allah in Torah and with these ten commandments, then what will be the outcome? What will be the result? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ You do all this with the Ten Commandments, hold them tight and hold them with full concentration and full strength and full willpower and focus your concentration to them. If you hold tight to the commandments of Allah, then you might be what? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ You might be God-fearing and you might get pious and righteous. So Allah ordered them a manner which would make them develop the fear and piety of Allah and the fear of hereafter and become pious and virtuous. Allah ordered and suggested and promised that if the Jews could connect to the book of Allah given to them, hold it tight, remember and mention the teachings of the book, they would become God-fearing and develop piety. Now we need to stop here and we need to think that if Jews, if those Jews whose, whose book was not complete, it was not perfect, and the book whose protection and whose security Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not taken, the, not taken the responsibility of protecting and keeping it secure, and the book was not protected and not secured, even holding tight and connecting to it would make them pious and righteous, then if we, if we, the followers of Prophet wasallam, and the students of Qur'an, if we hold tight and connect to Qur'an, we remember its teachings and messages, and we mention the messages and orders of Qur'an, then how surely would we become God-fearing? Would we become righteous and pious? Prophet Sallallahu said, Inni taraktu fikum shayen. Look, there is absolutely no doubt I am leaving behind myself two things. Kitabullah wa sunnati. The book of Allah and my sunnah and the mannerisms of Prophet Sallallahu If you hold tight to them, you will never go astray. And then, in another words of Prophet Sallallahu he said, Abshiru, good news, Abshiru, one hand of Quran and the book of Allah is in your hand and the other hand and the other end is in the hands of Allah. If you hold tight to it, you will never lose the path. Which path? The path we've been asking for, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, the path to Jannah. So, revise. How do we need to connect to the Quran? Bikuvatin. With strength, with power, and with full concentration. Exactly, exactly the way we hold our precious and valuable and expensive commodities. I can give you an example. If you are holding one of your French crystal bowls or one of your Queen Anne dishes, how would you hold it? Just with one hand, letting it hang freely, dangling around? No, you would hold it with both your hands. Strongly, carefully, with a dense concentration, not looking here and there, not being diverted, focusing and walking slowly and carefully. So that is, we, that is exactly how we need to connect with the best book of Allah, the most expensive, 
the most precious, the most valuable thing we have, we possess is Quran. So how do we need to connect to it? We need to make a strong bond. We need to be careful. We need to be focused. We need to concentrate while reading. And we do not need to look here and there, here, here and there. We need to hold the Quran with both our hands. This is the rope of Allah. And we don't have to hold the Quran with one hand. And with the second hand, we let the second hand free to accept the worldly orders, the customs of the family and the clans, the norms of the society, the rules and the regulations of the state which are contradictory to the Quran. Just holding to the Quran and Sunnah with one hand and the rest of the hand we are taking the other things. No, we need to hold to Quran and connect with Quran with both our hands, with full strength, full concentration, full focus, with, with full Feel full willpower, not diverting here and there, and just concentrating on the teachings of Quran. And secondly, after holding firmly to the Quran in this manner, we need to do what? We need to wathquru ma fihi. We need to remember. We need to remember the messages and teachings of Quran. And secondly, we need to keep on mentioning discussing and repeating and talking about the words of Quran because this is what Zalik al Kitabula Raibafi Hudalil Muttaqeen. This is the best book and there is absolutely no doubt that it is a book of guidance for all whom for the people who are God fearing. And third thing is to acquire piety and to acquire the fear of Allah and to become pious. What do we need to do? We need to connect with Quran and we need to mention the Quran and we need to remember the Quran. Now repeat the two supplications to acquire piety and to be pious. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Repeat again. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma and then there is another supplication of the Prophet Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuqa wal-afafa wal I repeat again and repeat with me. Say the words again. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuqa wal-afafa wal Amin Ya Rabbul Alameen. Now, verse number 65. Allah says, Summa tawallaytum min ba'di zalika, falawla fadlullahi alaykum wa rahmatuhu lakuntum min al khasirin. And then you turned away after that. And if not for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, you would have been among the losers. So in this verse 65, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that the people of Bani Israel, after being forced to make the covenant of obedience under the fear of the Mount Thur falling on them, the moment they were relieved of the fear, they went back on the covenant. They went back on the promise. And turning back from their promises in the covenant with Allah was a manner of the al maktub Was the manner of the cursed people. As we can repeat and we can revise that in the initial verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah has mentioned the traits of the disobedience they do what they break the covenants of Allah after after making them strong and after strengthening them so any person any family any society or any state if they make strong covenants with Allah 
and they strengthen their promises and covenants with Allah and then they go about breaking them and disobeying them then they will be labeled as what? They will be labeled as the cursed people and they will be what? They will be the transgressors and they will be what? They will be the disobedience. But here Allah mentions that Allah was still merciful and kind to them and they were still forgiven. So means what? That Allah does not punish people for all their wrong, wrongdoings. For all the wrongdoings and all the sins, people are not punished. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful and kind. He overlooks and He forgives most of the wrongdoings and most of the sins committed by people. And it is only for a few, only for a few which He punishes. And if Allah, if Allah's mercy and if Allah's kindness does not befall any, then surely the people will be among whom? Among the khasirin. La kuntum min al khasirin. Among the losers. So frequently do we need to ask for the mercy and kindness of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught, taught us a supplication in Quran. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. And it was the manner of the Prophet wasalam, that he used to very, very frequently supplicate for the mercy and for the kindness and for the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha asked him, asked him that why did he so frequently ask for the mercy and for the kindness and for the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he replied that Aisha, no one will enter into Jannah until he receives the mercy and the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And she inquired innocently that even you, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he answered, yes, Aisha, even I will not enter the Jannah until and unless Allah's mercy befalls upon me and I am blessed with his rahmah. So we need to ask for Allah's mercy very, very frequently. Is a supplication of the Quran. And then Prophet used to ask and supplicate for the Rahmah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Allahumma Rahmatika Arju, Fala Takilni ila Nafsi min Tarfata Ainin, Wa Aslikni Shakni Kullahu la ilaha illa anta. And then in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the supplication of Hazrat Ayyub alayhi salam when he was sick and when all his body and all the skin, all the skin over his body was covered with pustules, full of pus and leaking and oozing and all by himself with no person, no friend, no family, nobody to look after him, all by himself, being deprived of all the worldly blessings. He said what? He supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, Rabbi anni masani azuru wa anta arhamur rahimeen. Oh Allah, misery and distress, misery and distress has struck me and you only are the most merciful. Patience, patience of Hazrat Ayyub alayhi and tolerance of Hazrat Ayyub alayhi and then reliance of Hazrat Ayyub alayhi what remarkable patience and what what remarkable reliance on Allah. You see, he does not explain his miserable condition. He does not complain. There is no explanation. There is no narration of what he is suffering and what he is going through. Because he, he just briefly says, I am in distress and I am in a miserable state. Because... He knows, he knows that Allah is all seeing, he is all hearing, he is all knowing. What remarkable recognition of Allah. What superb, what superb reliance on Allah. So this is a Quranic supplication. And this is the dua of a prophet which was heard and granted. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to Hazrat Ayyub alayhi salam and then a fountain just came up and Hazrat Ayyub alayhi salam was asked to bathe in the water and all the skin ailment was cured. So this is a supplication mentioned in Quran. It is a supplication of Hazrat Ayyub alayhi salam which was heard, which was granted, which was accepted. So in any forms of illness, any state of distress or any miserable condition, we can make this dua. We will get the recitation, reward of the recitation of the Quran. We will be rewarded by the, by the reward of the following of a prophet or the, the sunnah of a prophet. And then inshallah, inshallah, our supplication will be heard. It will reach the throne of Allah. And especially if we make it with full reliance that inna inna rabbi la samiyud dua there is absolutely no doubt that my my rub my sustainer does does listen to my duas and supplication with full confidence and with full belief and faith that whenever i supplicate you answer you accept and you bless and you grant me with your blessings ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وحب لنا ملة كرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين